my pleasure and my privilege to welcome someone you all know, I'm sure, Dr. Ralph Martin of Renewal Ministries. And thanks to Renewal Ministries, subsidized the territory as a welcome to here. And I think he'll tell you about that uh, organization at the beginning of his talk. Ralph has been here all day today with the priests and he's with us tomorrow. He graciously agreed to spend some time with everyone else in the diocese. And so without further ado, I welcome Ralph Martin. Amen. Father, we thank you for the great gift of life that you've given us a chance to be alive. You've given us a chance to overcome all the wounds of sin and death and the devil and offering us the gift of eternal life, life forever. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus that makes it all possible. And the gift of your Holy Spirit that makes it all real to us, reminds us what it's all about. Jesus, we thank you for your amazing promise that wherever two or three people gather in your name, you're there. Lord, tonight we gather in your name. We thank you for you being present. We want you to be the one that speaks to us tonight. You to be the one that comforts us tonight. You to be the one that encourages us tonight. You to be the one that challenges us tonight. We ask this through Christ our Lord, our Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I actually feel, well, I know you all don't know me, so I will say a little bit about me. Um, I, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, which is about 40 miles west of Detroit. You know, Michigan, as you know, is right on the border with Canada, way over there. And uh, I teach at the Catholic Seminary in Detroit, Sacred Heart Seminary. And I also am president of a Catholic mission organization called Renewal Ministries. And we're devoted to Catholic renewal and evangelization. We, we have the longest running Catholic television program on EWTN. And, I think it's 30, maybe 35 years. And it's called The Choices We Face. And it's on Tuesday early evening and Friday early morning. And then we also have two Catholic radio programs. One's called uh, Fire on the Earth with Peter Herbeck. One's called Food for the Journey with Sister Ann Shields. Uh, we also do a lot of mission work in about maybe, depending on the year, 30 or 40 different countries. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. I, I just came back from two and a half weeks in Australia, speaking to priests in three different cities. And so we just, the Lord's given us a lot of opportunities to try to strengthen the church in, in a lot of different places and grateful for that. We also have an outreach to young adults and to uh, high school boys and girls. And we're just trying to help strengthen God's people wherever we can, however we can. Also during COVID, we couldn't travel anymore. So we started a, a YouTube channel and right now we have about 76,000 subscribers to it. And uh, some of the YouTube videos are getting like 200, 300,000 views. And uh, I do a new video every other week. And my colleague, Peter Herbeck, does one in the intervening week. And we, uh, we're just trying to help encourage people, strengthen people, help people keep their heads clear in the confusion that's going on in our culture and in the church, and help us keep our hearts at peace by our trust in Christ. And uh, so, you know, if you'd like to kind of stay in touch with what we're doing, just go to Renewal Ministries YouTube channel and you can subscribe and be notified. I guess you click on this little blue bell or something and they notify you when a new video gets posted. But uh, so I'm also married. I, I have six children. Uh, they're all grown and 19 grandchildren. Yeah, so and none of them are married yet, so I'm not a great grandfather yet. I'm just an ordinary grandfather, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, the topic for tonight is so uh, living as Catholics in challenging times. And I would say that uh, not everybody has a chance to come to Prince George, British Columbia. You know, I, I, I never thought I'd have the chance. 
and I'm really grateful for it. I've been grateful for being with your priest here during the day. I'm very impressed by them. They've already broken records. I've spoken to maybe 40 different dioceses, clergy over the last number of years, and they've got the highest attendance rate of their priest. They have more than 90% of their priests here. So only one priest because of medical reasons couldn't come. So that's really high. And they also have another record. They come back from breaks quicker than any priest I've ever known. <laughs> and so it's also good to be with the people in the 20 different locations. Uh, the Lord is with you. Uh, the Lord is with you wherever you are. And this is just so important for us all to know. You know, a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of loneliness in our culture today. There's a lot of isolation. COVID really increased that. And, and there's something that Jesus said in the, in the gospel that really I think is important for us to know. Jesus said, I am never alone. The Father is always with me. And we, we really need to embrace that for ourselves. If we're with Jesus, we're never alone. The Father is always with me. And Jesus is always with us. And every time we're feeling isolated or alone or discouraged, we really need to say, Jesus, I trust in you because he's present. He's with us. Okay, the topic tonight is living as Catholics in challenging times. Does anybody need convincing that these are challenging times? No, it's pretty, pretty clear that things have accelerated so quickly in the last number of years that it's almost hard to believe we've gotten to where we are with such a hostility to Christ and the church that's grown in the culture and such an aggressive kind of oppression of, of the Christian message. But anyway, Archbishop Gomez says, an elite leadership class has risen in our countries that is little interest in religion, no real attachment to the nations they live in or to local traditions or cultures. This group, which is in charge in corporations, governments, universities, the media, and in the cultural and professional establishments, wants to establish what we might call a global civilization. As they see it, religion, especially Christianity, only gets in the way of the society they hope to build. Unfortunately, I think that's the case. I think all the major levers of power and influence in Western cultures are now in the hands of people who really want to build a brave new world without God. It's a little bit like the rebellion in the garden where, you know, the devil says to our first human beings, did God really say this? Well, God did really say it. And then the devil says, you know, it's not true. You won't die. You'll be like God yourself. So there's really a, a profound casting off of the lordship of Christ and the, the authority of God in our culture. And, and creatures are declaring their independence from God. And, and the culture of death is spreading. You know, just like the Lord said, if you do these things, you'll die. If you separate yourself from me, you'll die. And so we're seeing the massive killing of babies. You know, I, you know, I just thought that, you know, the horrible thing that's happening in the Middle East and, and the horrible thing that happened with Hamas uh, coming into uh, this rave dance that was going on, this trance music festival where all night long people were doing drugs and, and who knows what. And... And they were killed. And then babies in a kibitz were killed. But then I thought to myself, how many babies have been killed in Israel through abortion in the same time period? It's almost like there's a blindness. We're horrified by people killing babies, but people are killing babies every day in enlightened, civilized countries. It's just sort of like a, a, a terrible spiritual blindness. Well, Pope Benedict XVI, after he resigned, kept writing. And one of the things he wrote was this. 100 years ago, everybody would have considered it to be absurd to speak of a homosexual marriage. 
Today, one is being excommunicated by society if one opposes it. The same applies to abortion and to the creation of human beings in the laboratory. Modern society is in the middle of formulating an anti-Christian creed. And if one opposes it, one is being punished by society with excommunication. The fear of the spiritual power of the Antichrist is then only more than natural. And it really needs the help of prayers on the part of an entire diocese and the universal church in order to resist it. So what Pope Benedict is saying is not just about universities. It's not just about governments. It's not just about media, but there's a powerful spiritual force that's behind the whole thing. He talks about the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, us Catholics aren't used to really talking about the Antichrist, but the Catechism of the Catholic Church gives some really clear teaching on it based on Scripture. Because what the Catholic Church believes is based on Scripture as it comes to us through the tradition of the Church. In section 675 of the Catechism, it says, Before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo messianism, messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and his Messiah come in the flesh. That's what's happening. Human beings are glorifying themselves in place of God. They're no longer worshiping God. They're worshiping themselves. There's a book that's just been published called The Apocalypse of the Sovereign Self, the manifestation of the sovereign self, where human beings are deciding that they know better than God, that they can be anything they want to be. They can create themselves. They can decide who they are, despite the way God created us. Pope Benedict says it's natural to be afraid when you perceive the spiritual power that's at work. When you see the power of it, the magnitude of it, how much it's gained control over everything and how it's closing in. Like I said, I was just in Australia uh, last month. And it's really advanced there. In the capital territory of Canberra, the capital of the country. The Catholic hospitals refuse to do abortions and the government's taking them over. In the state of Victoria, where Melbourne is, which used to be the most conservative place in Australia, they passed legislation that's so extreme. When I first heard about it, I thought it must be fake news. I thought this couldn't be the case. And so I asked a friend who was close to the situation about it. And what it does is that it actually penalizes anybody who would dare to counsel somebody who wants prayer or support in resisting same-sex temptation with prison sentences of years and with fines of thousands of dollars. People who are counselors, people who are pastors are, are being told that if you dare to counsel people who want help in resisting same-sex temptation, uh, you'll be fined, you'll go to prison, yeah. And it's really putting a clamp on the ability of the Catholic Church to help people, that type of thing. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer period afterwards. So, but but thank you for asking for clarification on that. Uh, and then in the state of Western Australia, where Perth is, uh, while I was there, the Parliament removed restrictions on abortion. That used to be, if a baby was born live during abortion. There'd have to be an investigation. You know, the doctors, the coroner would have to go and see what happened to this baby. Was proper care given to the baby? But they removed that requirement because they said it makes people feel uncomfortable because they're killing babies after they're born live, you know, with abortions. Also, I was there. The Archbishop of Perth was called before a parliamentary committee uh, to answer why he had kept hidden for six months a report on sexual abuse situations in the Diocese of Broome, 
north of Perth. And uh, it's just sort of like, uh, it's like the Catholic Church in Australia is just really under super attack. But it's also under super attack because they've lost their courage to preach the gospel in a certain way because of the clergy sex abuse crisis. They feel intimidated. They feel like they've lost the moral credibility. Uh, one of the bishops told me that they're just not listened to anymore by the government. So it's sort of like a, a bad situation. But that situation, as extreme as it is, is happening in all our countries. And it's only a matter of time. And it's already happening, of course. It's happening in Canada. It's happening in the United States. And quite honestly, people aren't going to give up until they've silenced the gospel. They just do not want to hear the truth about marriage and sexuality. They do not want to hear the truth about life. They don't want to hear the truth about how killing babies is not good. John Paul II, two years before he was elected Pope, made a visit to the United States in 1976, and in several different locations, he gave a talk that included this. You, some of you have probably heard of this because a lot of people are remembering it now, given our current circumstances. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of the American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We're now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation, though, lies within the plans of divine providence. God's permitting this extreme trial. It is a trial, though, which the whole church must take up and face courageously. Like Pope Benedict says, you know, it's natural to be afraid, but we have to resist what's happening. The scripture says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So what we have to do is we have to up our game. We have to get more than ever in Christ. We have to be more and ever clothed with Christ. We have to be more and ever clear about what the truth is. And we need to ask God to give us the courage never to deny the Lord. You know, persecution is coming. It's already here. here here's a seat way up front. You know how Catholics always have seats up front. So here's one up front. And if anybody wants to come up and just gather around, that's fine with me. Um, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. If this is a spiritual war, which it is, we really need to take seriously putting on the spiritual armor. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul says, this is not just about flesh and blood. This is about powers and principalities, forces and high powers in the darkness. And we need to put on the helmet of salvation. We need to really be clear that Jesus is the only savior that the human race has. He's the only name given by which human beings can be saved. We need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. We need to really commit ourselves to a life of holiness. We need to gird our clothing with the belt of truth. We really need to know clearly what the revealed truth of God's word is to us. And then we need to have the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? The shield of faith extinguishes the fiery darts of the evil one. Every day, all day long, the devil's firing fiery darts into our emotions, into our memories, in, into our feelings, trying to stir up uh, disordered desires, trying to stir up discouragement, trying to stir up fear. And the only way we can extinguish those fiery darts is with the shield of faith. So what's the shield of faith? The faith, shield of faith is, first of all, faith in Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the only name given by which people can be saved. Jesus is completely trustworthy. But also, faith in what Jesus says. Because there's a lot of people who still have a sentimental attachment to Jesus, but it's not the real Jesus. Jesus is a good guy. Jesus is uh, compassionate. Jesus is loving. True, but that's not the whole story about Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. What we believe and how we live is going to determine our eternal salvation. Christianity is not a game. There really is a heaven, there really is a hell. It really matters 
how we respond to Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people who are creating a Jesus in their own image. You know, sometimes I'll give a talk and share some of the challenging things that Jesus says. And more than once, somebody's come up to me and said, my Jesus would never say that. It's funny, but it's scary. Picking and choosing what we like that Jesus says is really profound rebellion. We don't understand who he is. He's the Lord. I want, I want to tell you my own experience of coming to understand that and how significant it is and how it's really the most important decision I ever made in my life. I grew up in a good Catholic family. My grandparents came from Ireland. We were Catholics. When I was growing up as a boy, I believed everything the nuns taught me. In those days, they were teaching really good stuff, you know, good, true stuff, you know. And I believed it, but there wasn't a fire in my heart. And as the world, the flesh, and the devil began to make a bigger and bigger impact on my life, I, I just was sort of drifting. And when I went to a Catholic university, Notre Dame, down in Indiana, uh, uh, I was looking for answers, but I, I just wasn't finding them. And I started off as a political science major and felt like that wasn't really fundamental enough in the questions I was asking. And then I became an English major, thinking maybe the, the beautiful themes of great world literature would give me the answers I was looking for. Then I became a philosophy major. My poor parents were thinking, what an unstable kid we have. <laughs> He's getting, he's getting further and further away from, you know, making a living philosophy, <laughs> philosophy major, you know, and, and honestly, honestly, the more I studied philosophy, the more confused I got because it was a matter of opinion. This philosopher said this, and this philosopher said this, and everybody was critiquing each other. And it was all, it was all human ideas. And I was looking for something solid. And then a friend urged me, harassed me, badgered me <laughs> into making a cursio. Uh, it's a weekend retreat. Some of you know about it. And it's like a, you know, a significant retreat. And finally, just to get him to stop bothering me, <laughs> I said, OK, I'll go. But I said, I'm going to warn you, I'm not going to fall for it. because. <laughs> Because I know people are going to have a warm human experience and they're going to call it God, but I'm not going to fall for it. I'm a philosophy major. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> well, I'm happy to report that I fell for it. Very happy to report that I fell for it. I heard this beautiful explanation of the Catholic faith. And I thought, wow, whoever invented Christianity was really smart. How dumb I was. But then they began to talk about Jesus. And that made me feel very uncomfortable. I said, why don't we keep this on a theoretical level? Why don't we talk about the second person of the Trinity? Or let's talk about <laughs> Christological theories type of thing. But they just kept talking about Jesus like, wow. And at a certain point, all I can say is that I felt like he was in the room. I didn't have any visions. I didn't hear any voices. I just became aware that this one they were talking about was there. And he was letting me become aware that he was there. I don't feel like he said anything to me. I don't think he asked anything of me other than what he was saying by him being there was, I am who am. I'm God. I really have been raised from the dead. I really am the Lord. I really am the one to all power and authority has been given by God the Father. And I knew he, I knew I needed to deal with it. I knew I couldn't ignore it. I knew I couldn't pretend that he wasn't there and he wasn't real and he hadn't really been raised from the dead. But it was a struggle. And at first I thought, well, maybe I can make a deal with Jesus. 
you know, maybe I'll come back to mass if he'd let me go on with my life as I was living it. <laughs> I knew he wasn't interested just in that. I knew that the only sensible response to make to Jesus is unconditional surrender. If he's the Lord, how stupid not just to say, my Lord and my God, and fall at his feet and say, speak, Lord, your servant listens. But it was a struggle. It wasn't until Sunday morning that I felt like God gave me the grace to humble. I was able to receive the grace he was giving me to humble myself, go to confession, be reconciled with the Lord and the church, and just open my life to the Lord. I didn't know where it was going to lead, but I can tell you this is the most significant decision I've ever made and the most significant decision anybody ever makes. There's only one thing necessary in our life. If our life is going to be a success, it's only a success because we surrender our life to Jesus. Amen. If our life is going to be a failure, it's only because we haven't surrendered our life to Jesus, no matter how many toys we have or how much worldly success we have. For indeed, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world, but suffer the loss of his soul? That's what really what it's all about. Then, on Sunday evening of that retreat, people came in who had made previous retreats, and I just had such an experience of God's love flowing into my soul. I didn't know scripture passages in those days, but Romans chapter 5 says the love of God is poured into our soul by the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened to me without me knowing about it. And, and a fire got ignited in my soul. I, I think what later I discovered in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, people talked about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think I got baptized in the Holy Spirit without ever not knowing what it was. And I think the Lord did it that way for me just to show me that this is something he wants to do for everybody. It's not about being part of a particular movement, but it's about being open and surrendered to the Lord and asking for everything that a grace he has. You know, I didn't think about it at the time, but I think what happened on Sunday morning was I renewed my baptismal commitment. And I think what happened on Sunday evening, I stirred up the graces of the Lord, stirred up the graces of sacramental confirmation in me. You know, like Paul says to Timothy, stir up the grace you've received through the laying out of my hands. And everybody here has been baptized, I assume, and has received the sacrament of confirmation. So stir up the gift that you receive. Let it be a flame, because the flame got ignited in me more than 50 years ago, and it's still, it's still burning. I, I remember at the end of the Curcio, they allow you to share what you got out of it, and I remember what I shared. I want to spend the rest of my life knowing and loving the Lord, and helping other people know and love of him as well. Now, I actually have nothing more profound to tell you than that, but I'm going to go on. <laughs> <laughs> it's all contained in Jesus as Lord. It's all there. And the implications of Jesus being Lord determines our life. It really, really does. But when John Paul II talked about us being in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the anti-church and the anti-Christ, he was saying something pretty significant. And then he referred us to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He actually wrote about this in a book called Sign of Contradiction. And what I just read there is in there. Where does the phrase sign of contradiction come from? It's come from Luke chapter 2. Simeon and Anna have been waiting for the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit moves them to come into the temple when Mary and Joseph arrive with baby Jesus. And Simeon sees baby Jesus and says, Lord, you can let me, you can let me go now. You've fulfilled your promise. I've seen him. But then he prophesied. He said, this baby will be the cause for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. He'll be a sign of contradiction. He'll reveal the secrets of hearts. And Mary, a sword will pass, will pierce your heart. What a, what a violent, sorrowful, 
painful image. Mary, a sword will pass your heart, pierce your heart. And we know that at the foot of the cross, a sword pierced Mary's heart as she shared in the excruciating death of Jesus. But this is telling us a lot about who Jesus is, the real Jesus. We can't know the real Jesus unless we know what sacred scripture reveals about him. And this is an important revelation. Not everybody's going to like Jesus. Not everybody's going to accept his teaching. Not everybody's even going to respond to his miracles with faith in him, but they're going to say, more bread, Jesus, more bread. <laughs> That's exactly what Jesus says. You're coming to me not because you recognize who I am. You're coming to me because you like to get fed. <laughs> Jesus was hoping the miracles he worked would lead people to recognize who he was and become disciples. Now, Sign of contradiction, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, John Paul II said, look at this text and you'll see more about what's going to happen in the final confrontation. Now, I don't know whether we're in the final confrontation or not, because the only way we'll know is if the Lord returns and puts down the Antichrist. That, that's how it ends. But Paul says, don't be confused by supposed prophecies that say the Lord has already come or he's about to come because he will not come until these two things take place first. First of all, the great apostasy. So what's the great apostasy? It isn't something that pagans do, it's something that Christians do. It's the turning away from faith on the part of those who once had it. We're certainly living in the midst of a great apostasy. The Catholic nations of France, the Catholic nation of Italy, the Catholic island, the Protestant island of England, all the Protestant and Catholic nations are seeing a massive repudiation of faith. The number of people who go to church in these countries is smaller and smaller and smaller. And the hostility and the indifference to Christ in the church is growing and growing and growing. One of the saddest things I've seen in recent years is after Ireland legalized abortion, Tens of thousands of Irish people flooded into the streets of Dublin celebrating that they now could be like the other nations of Europe and kill babies too. How dark, how fallen, how evil. So there's certainly a great apostasy going on. Whether it's the final apostasy or not, we won't know until the Lord returns or he doesn't. The second thing that Paul says needs to happen before the Lord returns is there's a certain restraint that the Lord has placed on evil. At a certain point before the Lord returns, that restrainer is going to be taken away and is going to be unrestrained lawlessness and evil. What we've seen even in our lifetime is the systematic stripping away of every restraint on evil. And it's just accelerating. And it's really hard to explain how quickly it's gone without recognizing that supernatural power is at work, like St. Pope Benedict pointed out. But then it goes on to say, at a certain point, the lawless one will appear. Most people think it's the Antichrist. And he'll use every deception at his disposal so that those destined to perish will perish. Now, for a long while, I didn't, I wasn't shocked by that. I'm shocked. Who's destined to perish? It goes on to say, those destined to perish because they refuse to open their hearts to the truth and be saved. Another translation says, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. And then it goes on to say, the means that the Antichrist is going to use to lead people to destruction is false signs and wonders and deception. Maybe sorcery, magic, who knows? Uh, maybe great spectacular deeds that aren't done by the power of God and don't lead people to repentance and faith, but lead people to marvel at the person who does them. But then it says every deception. So many times in the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of the apostles, there's warnings about don't be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you. 
Jesus warns about false teachers and false prophets. The apostles warn about people who are making a shipwreck of the faith. Then it goes on to say, when people refuse to love the truth, a darkness comes over them and they fall into even a deeper darkness. And the impression you get that the deeper darkness is the consequence or the punishment for closing their hearts to the truth. And it leads them to a place of darkness that it's virtually impossible to recover from. We can never make that judgment. Only God can make that judgment, but it's a tremendously serious warning about do not close your heart to the light of God. Do not close your hearts to the truth because it can lead to deeper and deeper darkness. The reading at mass today was Romans chapter one. I don't, I don't know if any of you noticed it or read it, but uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous analysis of what's going on in our culture. It's a tremendous description of what happens in a person's life when they turn away from God. It begins by saying, God has revealed himself to the whole human race. Everybody can know that God exists by looking at the creation. But rather than honor him as God or thank him as God, they gave into their own foolish thinking and they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they ended up worshiping the creature rather than the creature. Therefore, God turned them over to bondage to impurity. And it goes on to say that men gave up natural intercourse with women and had intercourse with each other, and women gave up natural intercourse with men and had intercourse with each other. So the punishment for closing your heart to the truth is bondage to sexual disorder. And so they thought they were wise, but they turned into fools. That's what the scripture says. So our culture is boasting of being liberated from the Ten Commandments, boasting of being liberated from Christian faith, declaring their freedom and independence, and they've turned into fools. They've turned into fools, and they become slaves of disordered passions. They've exalted themselves over God, and what a foolish thing to exalt a creature over God. So... I don't know whether this is the final confrontation or not, but I know that many of the things the scripture describes as happening is happening today. But what do we do? Well, let me say one, one more thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to eight o'clock if that's OK. I only come to Prince George once every 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to I want to give the best I can. But. Um, We need to, uh, what do we do about this situation? Well, it's complicated because if there was unity in the church, this would be a fabulous time to proclaim the gospel boldly. This would be a fabulous time to not be ashamed of the gospel and to announce with boldness and conviction and authority that Jesus Christ is the Lord and is the only hope of humanity and, and suffer persecution or martyrdom or whatever. Be a great time. But just at the time when the culture is suffocating us, the church is divided, confused. I never thought I'd see what I see happening today in my whole lifetime. Cardinals attacking cardinals, bishops attacking bishops, whole bishops conferences saying they don't believe what, what the church teaches about human sexuality anymore. It's a pretty serious situation. And, and somehow we're not getting a clear sound from the trumpet. And Paul says, when you don't get a clear sound from the trumpet, who's going to come for battle? And so who's coming for battle? We're divided. We're, we're weak. We're confused. We're, we're intimidated. We, we fear what people think more than fearing God. So we got a tough situation. So what do we do? We need to step up and take personal responsibility for knowing who Jesus is and knowing what he teaches. We can't depend on hearing it from others. We've got to take personal responsibility. That means really knowing the word of God. 
you know, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will remind you of things I've said. Well, if we don't know the things he said, how can the Holy Spirit remind us of them? So we really need to meditate on the word of God. And we need to recover our confidence in the inspiration and inerrancy of sacred scripture. You know, what does Vatican II say about how us Catholics should approach sacred scripture? In the Constitution and Divine Revelation, it says the primary author of sacred scripture is God. Can't say about that, can't say that about any other book. This is unique. Can't even say that about ecumenical councils. Can't say that about the catechism of the Catholic Church. They're not inspired by God in the same way. And it says, and of course, he works through human instruments. He works through people's culture and mentality and psychology. He works through culture. But what he inspires the sacred authors to assert is asserted by God. And then in section 11, it says, everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths that God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. Our salvation depends on paying attention to what God has revealed to us. And it starts with sacred scripture. A lot of Catholics have been shaken loose from confidence in sacred scripture, don't know how to take it. They've heard things like, well, if you don't know Greek or Hebrew, you know, forget it, you can't understand it. You know, if you don't know all the commentaries, forget it, you can't understand it. Uh, it's not true. Jesus rejoiced to his father and said, I thank you, Father, that what the learned and clever don't understand the mirrors of children are getting. God has ordered the plan of salvation so that the mirrors of children can understand it. So section 11 of the Constitution of Sacred Revelation is pretty important for us Catholics to pay attention to. Everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit to teach firmly, faithfully, without error, those truths that God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. So number one priority, recover our confidence in divine revelation, believe what God teaches us. Pope Benedict says the church believes the Bible. The church believes the evangelist. Number two, we got to really up our relationship with the Lord. If we're not taking some time each day for personal prayer, we need to start doing that. I've, I can't talk about it tonight, but it took me 10 years to write this book. It's the best wisdom the Catholic Church has about the journey to God. It's taking the writings of John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and Catherine of Siena and Teresa of Lisieux and Francis of Sales and Bernard de Clairvaux, putting it together in an orderly, clear way. We really need to access the depth of our tradition and the wisdom that God's given us in growing the spiritual life. Second most important decision I made a couple of weeks after I wrote the blank check to Jesus. You know, you know what he wrote in on a blank check, by the way? He said, everything forever. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew there wasn't a shred of selfishness in that. He wanted all of me to be redeemed. He wanted all of me to be healed. He wanted all of me to be loved. The Lord's not asking for everything from us because he needs us. It's because he loves us and wants us to have what he has, eternal life. Anyway, a couple of weeks after I made that decision, I knew I wasn't always going to feel the presence of God or the love of God in my heart like that. But I knew that this was the most important relationship in my life. And I needed to build into my life a structured time where I'm paying attention to God. So I, I know I needed to decide to take some each time each day for personal prayer. And, you know, Francis de Sales says, if you're a busy Catholic layperson, don't pray more than an hour a day unless your spiritual director says it's okay. Okay? Most Catholic lay people, when they hear that, say, I wouldn't dream of praying an hour a day. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? But the reason why Francis de Sales says it, he says, how do you expect as busy Catholic lay people in family life and work life to be in those situations 
a peaceful heart and a clear mind, sensitive to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, unless you're spending time with the Lord, unless you're really paying attention to Jesus, unless you're meditating on his word. It makes a lot of sense. Of course, if you're not used to praying an hour a day, start somewhere, but start. Take 15 or 20 minutes a day and just be quiet before the Lord. This little, uh, I don't know if I have it with me. No, I don't have it with me, but this little Magnificat thing, you know, like a little monthly publication that comes out of New York. Uh, I think it, I think it makes it across the border here to Canada too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it has a little little morning prayer, a little psalm. You know, it has daily scripture readings, it has a little uh, place for intercessions and meditation and the life of the saint. It's very helpful, you know. So just just be before the Lord, you know, and spend a little time, you know, meditating on His Word, not just reading it, but actually hearing what it says and talking to the Lord about it. Anyway, I wish I could go into a whole lot more about personal prayer, but that's really important. It's really important that we are close to the Lord, that we're really clothed with Jesus, that we really put on the mind and heart of the Lord. Thirdly, we need to recognize where the attack is coming right now. The, the point of the spear of the attack is on marriage and sexuality. If the devil can destroy human identity, if he can destroy us being created in the image of God, male and female, boy, he's well on his way to destroying the human race. If you can destroy the family, you're destroying future generations. Already, the pain in our culture by departing from God has reached such a point that all the Surgeon Generals of the United States, the last four or five Surgeon Generals say, we now have a mental health emergency. The amount of people who are consumed by anxiety and depression, the number of people who are confused and rootless with no foundation, and no, no principles by which to live their life is just growing. The, the pain in families, the pain in young people, what 40% of teenage girls have thought of committing suicide, don't we think something's going wrong? Don't we think something's wrong? When are we going to wake up and say, we're heading off the cliff? So we got to re get really clear about what the truth is about marriage and sexuality. What is it? It's not rocket science. God created us male and female for the purpose of coming together in holy marriage, open to life. That's it. That's it. But the implications of that, nobody wants to hear. What that means is that every exercise of genital sexuality outside of holy marriage is offensive to the Lord and damaging to people. Very damaging. First Corinthians chapter six, Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you. So we have to take a responsibility for not being deceived in this area. The world wants to deceive us. Our disordered desires would love to be deceived. We, we need to take responsibility not to be deceived by knowing the truth of God's word. Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. The fornicator, the adulterer, the person who engages in homosexual activity. We're not talking about orientation or temptation or whatever. We're talking about doing sexual things with people of the same sex. The drunkard, the idolater, the robber will not enter the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for our salvation. The Lord's not trying to keep us from any pleasure or happiness. He's trying to lead us to true life, to true love, to true peace, to true goodness. What that practically means is that pornography, Masturbation, fornication, adultery, homosexual activity is offensive to the Lord and damaging to people. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Better to enter the kingdom missing an eye or a hand or a foot than to go down to hell with an intact body. Jesus basically says, do whatever it takes to get free of serious sin. And we've been lulled into this cloud of acceptance and it's normal and everybody's doing it. 
Well, Jesus said broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many people are heading that way. But narrow is the door that leads to life, difficult to road, and few of them are finding it. So do you want to flow along in this haze of, of rationalization and self-deception over the cliff to destruction? Or do you want to embrace the cross of Christ and, and pick up your cross every day and deny yourself and follow him, even in these difficult areas? Do whatever it takes to get free from serious sin. If your smartphone is causing you to sin, get a dumb phone. <laughs> if your subscription to Netflix is weakening your desire to live a holy life, cancel it. If you're hanging around with certain people that weaken your desire to live a holy life, you got to change your friends. In fact, as a matter of fact, it's going to be very hard to persevere as Catholics today. First of all, Without personal loyalty to Christ, we just can't do it on cultural tradition. Like I'm, I come from a Catholic family. That's not going to be enough. It's got to be personal loyalty to Christ. It's got to be friendship with Christ. Also, it's got to be friendship with each other. We really need to be in relationship with other people who want to follow the Lord with us. We're going to need their support. We're going to need their encouragement. When we waver, when we get confused, when we get discouraged, we're going to need their support. So connect with others who want to follow the Lord. If taking more than one glass of wine weakens your resolve in living a holy life, stop. If, if, if going to a 12-step group would help you, go to a 12-step group. Do whatever it takes to get free of serious sin, because serious sin will kill you and will lead you to eternal destruction if it's not repented of. Okay, one more area. So one big area of deception is an area of marriage and sexuality. So we got to get really clear what the truth is there and really commit ourselves to it and really go through the struggle, even if it takes a long period of time to get free of serious sin. Another big deception, a really big one, is this. If I were to describe how many Catholics look at the world today, I describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven. Almost everybody's going that way. Narrow is the door, difficult the road that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Oh, good. Yes, yes. I did give you a little hint just a few minutes ago. There's some Bible believing Catholics in the room tonight. Yes, that's good. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are having that traveling that way. Look around, isn't that the situation today? Many are traveling that way, but narrow is the door that leads to life, difficult to road, and few that relatively few are finding it. Now, we're not fundamentalists, we don't take isolated scripture passages as Catholics, but we know that First Timothy chapter one says God wills the salvation of the whole human race. And everybody be saved by coming to the truth, but people have to come to the truth. People have to accept it. People have to surrender to it. You know, there's a lot of talk in the church today about the mercy of God. Well, Romans chapter 11, Paul says, consider both the kindness and the severity of God. But for the last 45, 50 years or so, all we've heard about is the kindness of God. God loves you. That's fine. That's good. But like somebody said, if you don't know what the bad news is that we're lost without Christ, when you hear the good news, it seems like no news. Yeah, good deal. God loves me. Paul says, consider both the kindness, and we might say the holiness of God. Consider both the love of God and the justice of God. We've, we've developed a distorted understanding of who God is because of a one-sided presentation of of the infinitely, transcendently holy God. And so we now fear people's opinions more than we fear God. It isn't true that God is so merciful that nobody will be lost. God is so merciful he doesn't desire anybody to be lost, but people have to respond to his mercy. Every time that Jesus shows mercy in the New Testament, he expects repentance. The woman caught in adultery in chapter 8, John's Gospel. Pharisees wanted to stone her. Jesus kind of disperses them. 
And he asked the woman, is there anybody left to condemn you? The woman says, no, Lord, nobody's left to condemn me. And then but Jesus says, I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. Jesus is showing tremendous mercy to her. But he's expecting her to respond to the mercy by going and sin no more. John chapter 5, the guy who for 38 years could never make it down to the pool of Siloam when the angels stirred the water. And he was, never could be the first one in. Jesus had compassion on him and healed him. But then scripture says, Jesus sought him out to tell him something. What did Jesus tell him? Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. Or the prodigal son, passionate father that we all are so familiar with, that we hear about all the time, how God is so merciful, God is so compassionate. Yes, but the compassion and mercy of God the Father couldn't be effective in the prodigal son until he changed direction. He left his father's house. He squandered his father's gifts. He got so low, he wished that somebody could give him the food that pigs eat to eat, and that's pretty low for a Jew. And finally, he said, you know what? I've gone the wrong direction. This is not working out. I'm going to return to my father's house and say, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. Then he reverses direction. He starts coming back to his father's house. The father rushes out to shower his love on him, but he couldn't do it until the son repented, until the son changed direction, until the son headed back to the father's house. Divine mercy devotion is one of the most popular devotions in the church today, but a lot of people don't know the whole that Jesus gave to St. Faustina. We just had her feast day. Time after time, Jesus says, so many souls are perishing because so few people are responding to my mercy. There needs to be a yes to mercy. There needs to be a surrender to mercy. There needs to be acknowledgement that we need mercy. Well, I could go on and on, but it is a few minutes after eight. I just want to say we're living in challenging times. Challenging times in the culture, challenging times in the church, but there's nothing happening that isn't happening under the providence of God. And the fact is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And not only that, he's the Lord. And he's going to come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. But we need to stand firm during this trial. We need to take personal responsibility for our relationship with the Lord. We need to take personal responsibility for knowing what Jesus actually says and teaches by our meditating on scripture, by our faithfulness to church teaching, by when somebody says something, checking it out in the catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, to change the catechism, I'm going to add a PS on that. But they haven't changed it yet. It's serious times, but it's also a time for heroism. It's a time for bravery. It's a time for courage. So, yes, here in the Diocese of Prince George, the Lord wants to raise up saints. Yeah. He wants to sit, raise up apostles. He wants to prepare people for suffering for Jesus. You might say, gee, I think that's beyond my pay grade. It's not. <laughs> the only reason why any of us have been created is to be one with God. The only reason why any of us have been created is to be one with God. And the only people who are in heaven are saints. Don't worry, you don't have to be a canonized saint. The, the diocese doesn't have enough money to kind of have send all your, all your causes to Rome to be canonized. But everybody who's in heaven is completely one with God. Everything in them that resists the will of God and the love of God has been purified. And that's what the Lord wants to begin to do with us here on earth. And all the saints say it's better to do it here on earth than do it in purgatory because the more one we're with God, the more fruitful our life is, the more free we are, the more love we have, the more we can be a blessing in other people's lives. So let's just end with a prayer. Lord, I thank you for your holy word. I thank you for not leaving us to wander and to wonder but to actually spell it out for us clearly what your plan is and what your provision is for the salvation of the human race. 
I thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word, the power of your word. I thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. I thank you, Lord, for the faithful priests and bishops who continue to speak your word and believe your word and come against error and deception. Lord, I thank you for everybody who's with us tonight in all the 20 different locations and right here in Prince George. May I should let your Holy Spirit come on the diocese of Prince George. Let your Holy Spirit come on and raise up people, ignite fire in people's hearts, the fire of your love. Amen.